Hey, everybody, another Unmuted with Marsha, and thank you for joining with us today. During the pandemic, so many people started to talk about telehealth. And as you know, I've worked on this issue for quite a while now. And a lot of times people would say, well, that's just a convenience. But during the pandemic, for people with complex medical issues, it really became a necessity. So we've seen tremendous growth in the telehealth field. And to touch on some of these topics today, we have the senior Republican commissioner at the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC in all the acronyms. And Brendan Carr is that senior Republican commissioner and has done a tremendous amount of work in this. So commissioner, welcome to Unmuted. I'm delighted that you're joining us. Uh, well, thank you so much for having me. And uh, thank you for your leadership. You know, we've been really lucky uh, to have you there at really the forefront, as you noted it, telehealth, rural broadband, uh, so many issues that you've been championing for a while. And now other people are catching up to you on the value and importance of this work. Well, it is important. And closing the digital divide is a goal that you and I have shared for quite a while now in making certain that everyone has access to high-speed internet. And I mentioned telehealth. Talk a little bit about what the FCC is doing to encourage adoption of telehealth. Well, we're really at an interesting point when it comes to technology. It used to be that the only way you could get high-quality care was to go to a brick-and-mortar facility. And that's a challenge, particularly for so many rural Americans, whether it's rural hospitals closing by the dozen, transportation issues getting to places, and we now have the technology that you can get high quality care right in your home if you have a connection. And the way we talk about it is it's the healthcare equivalent of shifting from blockbuster video to Netflix. You don't have to go to a place to get care. And this proved to be so, so important during COVID-19 pandemic. And a lot of this actually goes back to some work you did uh, during the, uh, the Trump presidency, working in March of 2020 uh, with CMS to waive these outdated rules that would have required you to go physically in person. And so that waiver that you advocated for allowed for this massive uptake of telehealth visits in this country. Just a week or two ago, I was in small town Parsons, Kansas, and they had zero telehealth visits before COVID-19. And they have about 1,200 telehealth visits a month right now. And we see that around the country. One thing we can do is there's a bill that you're on right now that would make those waivers permanent. permanent. I think that's so important. We cannot go back to sort of the pre-pandemic analog way of delivering healthcare. We've seen too clearly the benefits of this. I think you're exactly right. And that is why we are pushing to make these changes permanent. And we were great, greatly appreciative to CMS for waiving, allowing that waiver that I had pushed for and advocated for. And you're right, it has opened doors for better health opportunities for so many Tennesseans, so many Americans. So we're appreciative of those opportunities they have for a better quality of life and greater access to health care. One of the things that also came up during the pandemic was how much time people spend online. And as you're aware, we've been doing an investigation of big tech and the impact, the negative impact that they have on children with their mental health, addiction, things of that nature, children being tracked or followed online by child predators. I would love to get your take on the work that we're doing to hold Facebook and other big tech entities to account for how they data mine, how they surveil, how they use your information and make you, the online consumer, actually the product. I think this is another one where obviously you've been at the, the forefront of calling attention to some of the harms associated with big tech over the years. We've talked a lot about the harms that come from censorship and those activities, and you've got a, a really simple but powerful piece of legislation that would reform Section 230 by adding a few words to the statute but that would fundamentally promote more speech and less censorship. I hope that uh, bill gets across the finish line. To your point here, though, the mental and behavioral health issues is one that you've been driving at. And what's disturbing to me is at a point in time when 
Facebook and others were sitting on studies showing the negative effects of their applications on kids. They were going before Congress and telling you all that they're aware of studies that show the positive mental health benefits of these applications. And to me, this is like, you probably got some group of old uh, tobacco lobbyists sitting around somewhere saying, you know, even we were never so brazen to make those types of uh, double speak claims. And I think it goes to show that this whole concept of self-regulation for big tech has been nothing but a smokescreen. They're just hoping that people will move on and, uh, and get past this. But thankfully, you know, you're on this, Senator Blumenthal's on this. You have a uh, a bill, the open uh, app market legislation right. that would look at making sure we can have innovation, we can have competition to disrupt the gatekeeper power. A lot of people say, well, if you don't like it, build your own. And that's fine, except they can pull the plug on you when you try to build your own. That's why I think that piece of legislation you have out there is, is really important. Well, we think that it is mighty important to get that open app market bill and start addressing the preferencing issue. Because as you well know, not only do we see it in the apps with the payment systems, but look at search uh, with your search engine, look at product placement, look at information in the way uh, Google prioritizes that or Amazon with products. So we think that beginning to address preferencing is an important part of this entire equation. Yeah, that's exactly right. At, at the end of the day, I don't think we've ever in history seen such a wide gap between power and accountability than we see today with big tech. You know, we at the FCC uh, reversed the so-called Obama era net neutrality rules, but when we did so, we imposed basic transparency requirements. You have legislation out there that would address privacy issues. So even when people look at ISPs and claim that we completely deregulated, which we didn't, there's a lot more laws and regulations that apply to ISPs and to big tech. So we got to close that gap and bring some modicum of accountability to these entities. We certainly feel like that that needs to be done. I want to go back to the issue of broadband and closing that digital divide which we have to make certain that, that we do. 5G is fast coming. Uh, we have more communities that say to us, look, you can't have 21st century economic development, education, healthcare, or law enforcement without access to high-speed internet. So as we look at this, we know that the infrastructure bill uh, turned out to be a about a lot more than just infrastructure, which we look at roads and rivers and railways and runways and broadband now as traditional infrastructure. Any thoughts on that infrastructure bill that's moving? Well, it's interesting. You know, a lot of people are telling this story that say we have to pass this 1.5 trillion or we have to have this 3.5 trillion in order to bridge the digital divide. And one of the things that they're missing is the literally hundreds of billions of dollars that are already available to bridge the digital divide. So at the FCC alone, we spend $10 billion every single year on efforts to bridge the digital divide. We're making progress. We're, we're far from the finish line. We're not waving the mission accomplished flag. But in addition to that baseline 10 billion, we've recently been given $10 billion by Congress for new low-income affordability programs. We completed an auction at the end of last year for a, an additional I know, if, you know it sounds like I'm saying the same thing over again, but an additional $10 billion in funding, including money for Tennessee. And that money hasn't gone out the door yet, uh, other than maybe less than 1% of it. So if you actually care about bridging the digital divide, the most important thing we can do today is to move the funding into the field that's already been allocated. And if you step back and you look at all the agencies that have money right now that could be used for bridging the digital divide, it's $800 billion. So we already have 10 times the amount of money that's needed to bridge the digital divide out there across ag, education, commerce, FCC, treasury. And so the challenge isn't necessarily cutting bigger checks from Congress. It's let's implement the dollars that are already in the pipeline. I know that's the hard work. People like to you know, get a headline and pass a bill with billions of broadband. But we're at the point where if you care about bridging the digital divide, implement the billions of dollars that are already available across the agencies, because otherwise we're going to flash forward two or three years, that money is going to get burned up. People are going to say, well, you know, waste, fraud, abuse, what are you going to do? But we have a chance right now to stop that if the Biden administration properly administers those funds. 
I think you're exactly right on that. And our uh, viewers can keep up with the good work you're doing there at the FCC at Brendan Carr FCC. That's where they're going to find you on social media. And of course, we appreciate that you join us for Unmuted with Marsha. And our newsletter is available at blackburn.senate.gov or you'll find us online at Marsha Blackburn. Thanks so much. Thanks.